I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Jesus Christ shows himself to be a servant when he washes the disciples' feet. And by this he proves what he said elsewhere, that the Son of God did not come to be served, but to serve. But already here, Jesus modeled the servanthood when he came to dwell among us as man. And he became a servant when he obeyed God's will. Throughout the Gospel of John, we see a number of ways that encapsulate his servanthood. I'll summarize them briefly for you. Before we think about what went in the minds of the disciples at this moment. So here the lens is widened uh, through the, the record of scripture uh, as we saw it through the eyes in retrospect of St. John. He always did the will of the Father. Uh, this is made known throughout the Gospel of John. We've got scripture proofs for all these, these four assertions. He never sought to please himself, but always to please the Father. He finished the work that God had sent for him to do, and Jesus came to glorify the Father, not himself. These are all qualities of a servant, and these are all things that he said about himself throughout the gospel. But when he came to wash the disciples' feet, he was not just serving the Father, but he's serving us, even all humanity. And as he said, he gives us an example that we might follow. And so that brings us to what might have been going through the minds of the disciples at this point without having the opportunity at this yet to reflect on it as we heard from the record of John's gospel. Could it be that they recognize the servant, that mysterious servant foretold in the book of the prophet Isaiah. In that book, many of the, the scriptures are familiar to us, and we'll recount them in a moment. We see that Jesus came to work in the world, in his servants. He embraced obedience over and against the obstinance of his people, and he became the suffering servant. In Isaiah 42, we have the first introduction of this servant. These are called psalms, songs, by the way, often re referred to as songs. Very beautiful uh, because they're poetic in how they describe this servant that is to come. Isaiah 42, we first hear him introduced as my servant, here is my servant, God speaks through Isaiah, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. And so here we have a servant of God, and kings at times can be referred to as servants uh, on a certain level, uh, kings one to another. And kings are the ones who bring about justice in the world. But then we see this contrast, almost a contradiction, where it says that how he will bring about this justice, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. And he will deal gently. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Is this the work of kings who don't raise their voices or cry out? It's the ability to proclaim their proclamation that, that, that kings establish themselves. They have the loudest voices in the land. Certainly Jesus spoke throughout his gospels, but he did not do so with the kind of force that earthly kings do. And so that brings us to how he went about his work in the world. And 
we normally we don't find it natural, do we, to to act as servants? Uh, servants are in the employ of another. They have less rights. They are they are working their way up the ladder of society. And so, have you ever uh, been in a role of serving and not being able to see the ultimate end of what you're asked to do? And have you ever felt like the work that you're doing seemed meaningless? Well, this servant of Isaiah, this mysterious servant, said that's what he experienced as well. As Isaiah, as he, he speaks through the, the words of Isaiah, now the voice of the servant. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. This is how it feels, not see the end of one's work. But yet by faith this servant knows that the one who he serves will bring it to completion. For then he says, surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. His reward is in his faith. And so this, this whole, this idea of a servant was mysterious. Uh, who is this servant? And theologians still grapple with this on some level. And some will will assert, well, this is, this is Israel in its first interpretation. Uh, Israel called to serve the nations. Um, but clearly we see here that this is personified as an individual, not just as a nation, even an individual who will bring out the salvation of Israel. For now, in, uh, we, we, we see that in the second song of Isaiah, that this servant will bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. As the disciples find their Lord washing their feet, could they be connecting the dots that he is fulfilling the servanthood of the Lord? Could he be bringing to pass this, what seems like a dichotomy, a, a king who does not rule forcefully, but serves. Could he be fulfilling this role finally in history? Even as a servant goes beyond Israel, as the second song says, now God speaking to this servant, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Could these words that Jesus shared that, that irked the Pharisees so much, could it finally be clicking in the minds of the disciples that this is what he's referring to when he said that he would be a light to the Gentiles, even through initially the words of Simeon when he was born? In the third song of Isaiah, we see that obedience will result in persecution. Now the disciples had not yet seen what this would look like for their Lord, but it was predicted. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. And here this obedience is in contrast to the obstinance over history of God's people who wanted to be served rather than to serve. But now the suffering servant enters into time and washes the feet of his disciples. And then we have the culmination in the fourth song where we see the extent to which the servant suffers. And here, who is he serving but you and me? As now the people of God respond about the servant. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Moving ahead, it says why the servant dies. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. 
and the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. This is his ultimate work of service, prefigured by the washing of feet, nothing less than the substitutionary atonement, his life for ours. That supreme act of servanthood when he died on the cross and gave his life as a ransom for us all. And so is it no wonder that as we will soon recount in Easter season how the disciples walked on the Emmaus Road and saw how all the scriptures pointed to Jesus. Henry Nouwen reflects, our God is a servant God. It is difficult for us to comprehend that we are liberated by someone who became powerless, that we are being strengthened by someone who became weak, that we find new hope in someone who divested himself of all distinctions, and that we find a leader in someone who became a servant. And is it no wonder that when Philip encountered the Ethiopian eunuch, that this that these songs of the servant were what he was studying when he said, can you explain these to me? And he found a perfect picture explained to him by Philip of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we have an opportunity to be served anew, even as we enter more deeply into the Mass, and we have an opportunity as our souls are formed by the Triduum to become servants who serve ourselves on behalf of our Lord.